Grace and peace to you, everyone. Grace and peace to you, and welcome to another Sunday evening Bible study. My name is Brother Sheflon Ballantyne. And my name is Sister Anne-Marie Ballantyne, and we are from the Thusia Seventh-day Adventist Church. Remember that the Thusia Seventh-day Adventist Church is a revival and reformation of true Seventh-day Adventism and ancient apostolic Christianity. Thank you for joining us and help us to share by God's grace. Amen. Amen. So please share the live. Please share the live. We are going to continue our Bible study this evening. Uh, we the week uh, last week, and we're going to continue where we left off from Revelation chapter 17. But before we go any further, I want to invite you to bow your heads with us for a word of prayer. Loving Father who art in heaven, we thank you so much for your love and your kindness towards us. We thank you, dear Lord, for the revelation of truth, revealed truths, dear Father. Your plan to alleviate non-reality from us, making us sin-free and fulfilling purpose through us while we are pilgrims here on the earth. We pray, dear Father, that you will help us now as we Enter into your words, grant us your Holy Spirit, help us to speak the truth and nothing but the truth from your light bearing in our hearts. We pray in Jesus' holy name. Amen. Amen. So once again, please help us to share the live. Please help us to share. We are going to continue looking at Revelation chapter 17 and we're going to have a brief review. Sister Anne will give a brief recap. Uh, concerning what we looked at last time. Grace and peace to you, Sister Karima, Brother Midon, Sister Amanda Asana, grace and peace to you and welcome. And please help us in sharing the live. Amen. 
Okay, grace and peace again, everyone. And let's go into the quick review of Revelation chapter 17, verses 12 and 13. Those are the two verses we looked at last time. But as usual, we give you a reminder that Revelation chapter 17 deals with the destruction of the whole, the destruction of false religion. That is what it is about. So let's go to verses 12 and 13 and we'll read them over quickly. Revelation chapter 17. Get your Bibles, follow along, get your pens, get your paper. Take your notes by God's grace, okay? Verse 12, it says, And the ten horns which thou sawest are ten kings, which have received no kingdom as yet, but receive power as kings one hour with the beast. These have one mind and shall give their power and strength unto the beast. So those were the two verses we looked at last time. And I just want to just give a few summary points. One of the first things we saw was that the ten horns are the nations of Europe that would develop out of the Western Roman Empire with boundaries that would change over a time or over time. In John's time, they had received no kingdom as yet. Remember, John was, was under the sixth kingdom, which was Rome. So these kingdoms, these nations had not received any power during John's time. Okay. But will receive power with the scarlet colored beast or communism, globalism, illuminism, meaning Europe will become communists. So these nations, nations of Europe will become communists. Okay, they will make alliance with the, with the scarlet colored beast. Yes, it's right there. This alliance is only for one prophetic hour, which is 15 literal days. And Brother Shefflin, we took some time working out that, right? They will be in political operations or operation for 15 days. In this 15 days, when Europe is illuminized or socialized, they will have one mind or one opinion. Remember the scripture says, just go back quickly in verse 13. It says, these have one mind and shall give their power and strength unto the beast. So the one mind there is the one opinion. And this opinion is the philosophy of communism. This one opinion consented to by all the nations of Europe is socialism or the new world order. The Bible goes on to talk about um, these nations giving their power and strength unto the beast. So what does that mean? The constitutions of these nations will become communists. So the power, when you talk about the power of a nation, you're talking about the, the, the dunamis, the ability of a nation. And that is in the constitution. It is a constitution that um, the, the country or the nation is operated by. Mm -hmm. Okay, so the constitutions of these nations will become communists with the no rights and freedoms philosophy of the scarlet colored beast. And that's what communism is all about. It's about the destruction of the rights of man. No regard for the right to religious liberty. No regard for private property. It's just warring against God, warring against religion. And they make, they make that very clear in the communist manifesto. All right. What about the part that talks about strength? given the strength, okay? Because it says they shall give their power and strength unto the beast. The strength, we saw that the Greek word for strength is exousia, which means authority. So the authority of the European nations is their government, is their legislature, is their judiciary. So they will be given their authority to the scarlet colored beast with the relative executive powers. This will bring persecution including persecution of God's people. So how do I end? How do I end this summary review? By letting us know, brethren and friends, that great trouble is ahead. Great trouble is ahead. But you have hope. And we're going to talk about this hope this evening in talking about them, which will overcome them. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much, Sister Anne-Marie. Amen. And so what we're going to continue with, like she says, we are going to continue by looking at 
what the following verse says. Revelation chapter 17 and verse 14. And we hope that you will grab your Bibles with us this evening as we go through this verse. And as we understand, put in line upon line, precept upon precept, to get a clear understanding from the Holy Spirit as to what these verses uh, signify. So turn with us to Revelation chapter 17. That's our key chapter. That's what we are exegeting. And we are looking at verse 14. But customarily, we'll, we will always go back to verse 1 to remind you because there's a high point that is coming up that will reflect a lot on verse 1, right? It says in verse 1, Revelation 17, verse 1, it says, And there came one of the seven angels which had the seven vials and talked with me, saying unto me, Come hither, I will show unto thee the judgment of the great whore that sitteth upon many waters. So Revelation chapter 17 is a chapter that outlines the judgment, God's judgment upon the great whore. And this great whore is identified in verse four, in verse 5, where it says, let me read verse 4 as well. And the woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet color and decked with gold and precious stones and pearls, having a golden cup in her hand full of abominations and filthiness of her fornication. Verse 5, and upon her forehead was a name written, Mystery, Babylon the Great, the Mother of Harlots, and abominations of the earth. So we know the judgment will fall upon Babylon, which is consisting of the great whore and her daughters. So we are talking about Babylon and her daughters because the Bible says that, in fact, the, she is the mother of harlots. So Babylon, the great, the mother of harlots and the abomination of the earth, this identifies the papacy and her daughters. And this is upon whom the judgment will fall. That is described in Revelation chapter 17. And we're going to see the verses that specifically outline how this will take place. But this evening, our focus is on verse 14. Having read verses verse 13, we go into 14. So let's just reread verse 13 into verse 14. Because it's important for us to set the context within which verse 14 is taking place. Yes. Verses 13 and 14, it says, These have one mind and shall give their power and strength unto the beast. These shall make war with the lamb and the lamb shall overcome them. For he is a lord of lords and king of kings. And they that are with him are called and chosen and faithful. Amen. Now the Bible says in verse 13, these have one mind. In verse 14, these shall make war with the lamb. And verse 12, we showed before, identifies who this these represent. It is the ten horns, which are the ten nations of Europe, which are the nations of Europe which is symbolic of the world. So here we are being told in verse 12, in verse 13, that these have one mind and shall give their power and strength unto the beast, which the Sand Marine Review points out that this simply means Europe will become communist. And as a result, that influence of communism spreads throughout the world. So this is what the Bible is telling us. These nations will be in alliance with Illu the Illuminati, with communism, with globalism, with atheism. In one mind, that one mind is one opinion. And we identified that last week. So here's what the Bible says in verse 14. These shall make war with the lamb and the lamb shall overcome them. Let me, let me just share the scripture there. So this is the scripture we, we're looking at. It says, These shall make war with the Lamb, and the Lamb shall overcome them. Did you see that? Now, how will they be making war with the Lamb? The Lamb we know is Jesus Christ. And we had such a wonderful Bible study on Sabbath called the Wrath of the Lamb. And 
we may just reflect a little bit on it as we go through this portion. Yes. All right. But we are told here that the, the nations of Europe shall make war with the Lamb, who is Jesus Christ, in the personage of his followers. Because the Lamb is not here physically. Jesus Christ is not standing up anywhere physically where he can be attacked or war can be declared upon his person. But how is this war waged against the Lamb? It is through his followers. And these followers, the Bible says, are with him. Because here it says, These shall make war with the Lamb, and the Lamb shall overcome them. For he is Lord of Lords and King of Kings, and they that are with him. So you identify here in the scripture that those who will receive the persecution are those who are with Christ. Mm -hmm. So the war with the Lamb will be the war with Jesus Christ through his followers. And we want to see this concept in the scriptures. First scripture we want to look at is John. John chapter 15 verses 20 and 21 because this shows us what Jesus Christ said that his people will be persecuted even as he was persecuted and his people will be persecuted for his sake. So let's see what that scripture says. Okay, John chapter 15 and we are looking at verses 20 and 21. Yes. It says, and Jesus is speaking here, he says, Remember the word that I said unto you, the servant is not greater than his Lord. If they have persecuted me, they will also persecute you. If they have kept my saying, they will keep your sins, yours too, or yours also. Verse 21. But all these things will they do unto you for my name's sake, because they know not him that sent me. Amen. Amen. So did you see that? So the Bible is showing they will also persecute you, Jesus says, because they persecuted me. So when we receive persecution, it is the lamb who is being persecuted. The reason why we are being persecuted is because the lamb is in us. It is because the character of Christ, the faith of Jesus Christ, revealed truths are in us. Amen. And as a result of that, men hate that, even as they hated Jesus Christ himself. And so we become the object of their persecution. But if we were on their side, we're still flesh and blood. Mm -hmm. We are still human beings. But if we were on their side without the lamb, we would not be suffering that persecution. So the issue here is the lamb. And this is what the scripture is saying. His people will be persecuted. That's what, that's what Jesus Christ says. Let's see the concept in Acts chapter 8. In the early church, the early church was also persecuted. And here's how that persecution was described. Acts 8, verse 1, verse 3, and verse 4. Acts chapter 8, verse 1 says, and Saul was consenting unto his death. That's referring to Stephen's death, right? And at that time, there was a great persecution against the church, which was at Jerusalem. And they were all scattered abroad throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. Verse 3. As for Saul... He made havoc of the church, entering into every house and hauling men and women, committed them to prison. Verse 5. Verse 4. Therefore, they that were scattered abroad went everywhere preaching the word. Right. So we see Paul persecuting. Mm-hmm. See Paul, Paul persecuting the church. And the scripture tells us that it was a great persecution against the church in verse 1. Mm-hmm. And in verse 3, it says that he scattered them, right? He made havoc of the church, mm-hmm. it says. And in verse 4, it says that he scattered them 
or they, they that were scattered abroad, right? Uh, they, they went about preaching the word. So Paul was persecuting the church, mm -hmm. right? Hello. Paul was persecuting the church. This is what the scripture says. Paul was persecuting the church. He wrecked havoc. He scattered them abroad. It was a great persecution against the church. So let's look at uh, chapter 9 and it's see the concept of persecution against Jesus Christ. In his saints. Amen. In his saints. Okay, so we are looking at chapter 9 now. At chapter 9 from verse 1 to 5. Okay, I'll, I'll, I'll read it. It says, And Saul, yet breathing out threatenings and slaughter against the disciples of the Lord, went unto the high priest and desired of him letters to Damascus, to the synagogues, that if he found any of his way, whether they were men or women, any of this way, any of this way, sorry, whether they were men or women, he might bring them bound unto Jerusalem. They have a man on a mission to bring the Christians back to Jerusalem as prisoners. For what? For preaching Jesus Christ, that Jesus Christ is the Messiah. Verse 3 says, And as he journeyed, he came near Damascus, and suddenly there shined round about him a light from heaven. And he fell to the earth, and heard a voice saying unto him, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? Did you see that? Verse 5 says, And he said, Who art thou, Lord? And the Lord said, I am Jesus, whom thou persecutest. It is hard for thee to kick against the bricks. So the scripture is showing here, look, look, Paul was not, Paul was not, um, physically inflicting any sort of persecution on the person of Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ had already resurrected. Jesus Christ had already ascended into heaven. But here Jesus Christ appears unto Paul, unto Saul of Tarsus, before he became Paul, and he accused Saul of Tarsus of persecuting him. This is Jesus, whom thou persecutest. But we read already that he was persecuting the church. So the concept that persecuting the church is persecuting Jesus Christ is here in the scriptures. Amen. Amen. So when Revelation 17, 14 tells us that they make war with the Lamb, we know that this is through his saints. Yes. Amen. We know that this is through his sins. All right? Amen. So what, what we are going to see here now, there are about two quotations that we want to read. Um, uh, we'll, we'll read these from the great controversy. So keep that concept in mind. Keep that understanding in mind. Because when we go back to Revelation 17 and verse 14, it says, there shall these, these sorry, these. these shall make war with the lamb. So we know that when it says these shall make war with the lamb, you should not have an image in your mind of a group of people fighting against a physical lamb or fighting against the physical body of Jesus Christ. But this is nations fighting against Christ through his sins. So the persecution will be against the sins. The and this Christ is, in us. Exactly. And this is what the Bible says. So the ten horns make war with the lamb. And they, 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 these, these ten horns, the, the European nations, uniting with um, atheistic, communistic philosophies, they are making war with the lamb. Before the, clo um, the close of probation, you're talking like all oh, now they're, they're making war with the lamb. They will continue to make war with the lamb. And they will make war with the lamb after the close of probation as well. Right? You see that through because their principles that they are like transgenderism. Exactly. See that through the principles. Clear now. 
They exactly. hate Christ. They hate Christ and they do all things and they will do all things to destroy the influence of Christ in society. So that exactly. is very clear now. Because that is, that is what, that is why, that is why we have, for instance, No Just For Timmy, BS For Binary, Political Sodomy, all of these books. Because, Push back. Exactly. Because communism, atheism, the Illuminati, globalism, they are fighting against Islam all now. They will continue to fight against Islam during the seven last plagues, right? Before, uh, that should be after probation is closed. So you're talking about for as long as the time span between all right, let's 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 look back at the scripture here. Do I still have it up? All right, because this, this is an important point to make. It says, let's read the scripture again. It says, They shall make war with the Lamb, and the Lamb shall overcome them, for he is Lord of Lords and King of Kings. We'll get to that part just now. And they that are with him are called, chosen, and faithful. So the war with the Lamb, since it's war against the saints, then our attention is brought to those that are with him. What about these people who are with him? They are his people. And the scripture says they are called, they are chosen, and they are faithful. Amen. So throughout these periods of them being called, which is before the close of probation, them being faithful, I mean chosen, which is in, in, in investigative judgment, and them being faithful, during the time of Jacob's trouble, throughout this period, this, these nations will be making war with the Lamb. Yes. Yeah. And that's, that's very important to understand. So here's what we are told. In the Great Controversy, on page 615, it says this, as the Sabbath has become, all right, as the Sabbath, let me just take down this. Um, as the Sabbath has become the special point of controversy throughout Christendom, and religious and secular authorities have combined to enforce the observance of Sunday, the persistent refusal of a small minority to yield to the popular demand will make them the object of universal execration. She continues, It will be urged that the few who stand in opposition to an institution of the church and a law of the state ought not to be tolerated, that it is better for them to suffer than whole nations to be thrown into confusion and lawlessness. So this is during the time of the Sunday law. She's, she's referring to here. This is during the time of the Sunday law. Interestingly, you remember but, what was said about Christ. Yes. Better for him to die. One yes. man to die. And we are talking about Christ being persecuted. Saints, right? And yes. here's what she's saying that they would say yes. about us. That little company. Right. I so, picked up that. So, so, so you have even during these time, these times, the ten nations will be involved in the Sunday law too. Mm -hmm. Secular thought. Exactly. Mm -hmm. So they will be involved in fighting against the saints too. They will be cooperating with the with the with this um with the woman in fighting against the saints as well. At at that point, then she goes on to say. This argument will appear conclusive. What argument? That is better for them to suffer than for whole nations to be thrown into confusion and lawlessness, right? The saints to suffer. This argument will appear conclusive and a decree will finally be issued against those who hallow the Sabbath of the fourth commandment, denouncing them as deserving of the severest punishment and giving the people liberty after a certain time to put them to death. What, what we refer to as the universal death decree. 
Romanism in the old world and the apostate Protestantism in the new will pursue a similar course toward those who honor all the divine precepts. The people of God will then be plunged into those scenes of afflictions and distress described by the prophet as the time of Jacob's trouble. So we have all of this happening. The global Sunday law. The woman sitting on the beast. The scarlet colored beast. Who is bearing her up. As she pursues this slaughter of the saints. During, the time, during that uh, period of global Sunday law and universal persecution. And it comes to a point when a de decree will be issued and the 144,000 will be all that remains who are saints of God will be plunged into this experience of the time of Jacob's trouble. Mm -hmm. And we are telling you, it is not just the Roman Catholic papacy and her daughters. It is its Europe, it is the 10 nations who will be involved, who is described here in Revelation chapter 17 as well. Mm -hmm. And that is part of their making war. So they make, they make war from when the saints were chosen, which is all now. They are making war with us, against us. They, are, they, they will make war later on, right down to the very end, when they, when they dissolve in, into self-destruction. Right? And then she says this, in the same great controversy, she says, as Satan influenced Esau to march against Jacob, so he will store up the wicked to destroy God's people in the time of trouble. The wicked will force in the king of the south, the godless rabble. Yes. So the wicked will be against us. King of the south, king of the north, once you're not in Christ, once you don't have the character of Christ, you'll be warring against God's people or the lamb in, this, in his sins. Yes. Right? So you ask, well, how, this, how will this pan out? Well, you have unity between the king of the north and the king of the south Persecution. in persecuting the saints until the, 15, the last 15 days. Not true? Yes. Yes. And in the last 15 days, that will be the time when destruction will come from the king of the south to the woman to, to eat her flesh mm -hmm. and to burn her. And all of those institutions and all of those um, mega um, churches and, and religious leaders will be destroyed. And the Pope himself will be reserved to see the second coming of Jesus Christ, where he receive a special um, striking down by Jesus Christ himself. So you, 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 you have the events that are outlined in scriptures which identify the war against the Lamb. Mm -hmm. And we are able to identify the agents whom Satan will use to bring, to, to bring persecution against the saints, right? But the beauty is, the Bible says, let's go back to the scripture because the scripture is very uh, pregnant with truth, it says, These shall make war with the Lamb, and the Lamb shall overcome them. Mm -hmm. And here is where our hope lies that the Lamb shall overcome them. You know why? It says, It gives you the reason why. For He is what? Lord, Lord of Lord. Lords and Lord of God. King, King of Kings. Kings. And this Lamb has wrath, you know. This Lamb is not like any malnourished lion or anything like that. This, this is the Lamb. That has wrath. Scripture tells us that. Right? Let's look at the fact that this lamb will overcome them. But how? The lamb will overcome them with what? Seven last plagues. Seven last plagues. Let's see it in Scripture. Yes. So turn with us to Revelation chapter. 16, get an understanding of these plagues. In some cases, a grievous ulcer maims the people of these nations. So let's look at the first plague, Revelation chapter 16 
and we are looking at verse 2. Let me just read verse 1 as well. It says, And I heard a great voice out of the temple saying to the seven angels, Go your ways and pour out the vials of the wrath of God upon the earth. So you're talking about the wrath of God, but you're talking about the plagues. So it shows that the plagues are really the wrath of God. And we will see that further. So let's look at the first plague in verse 2. It says, And the first went and poured out his vial upon the earth, and there fell a noisome and grievous sore upon men, upon the men which had the mark of the beast, and upon them which worshipped his image. So the first plague there, it says is a grievous sore, right? A noisome and grievous sore. And it tells us upon whom this will fall, right? Mm -hmm. But the point we are looking at, we are just looking at the plagues themselves. So the first, in the first case, we see that it is a grievous ulcer, which maims the people of these nations. Some of the fishing industry, this is Brother Medina's, in his note, he says, some of the fishing industry of these nations are destroyed by the red tide or the blood. Let's go to Revelation chapter 16 and verse 3. You see this? This, this is, is now. This is in the second. Second, yes, mm -hmm. the second. So we're just moving along. Verse 3, it says, And the second angel poured out his vial upon the sea, and it became as the blood of a dead man, and every living soul died in the sea. I mean, we just had plague number two, eh? and nobody should want to receive these plagues. Exactly. When there is hope, there is hope for salvation. There is Jesus Christ to save you. Mm -hmm. So you do not have to be a part of this destruction. Yeah. We can't just, just think about it. Just think about it because I think it's important. Here you have the first plague is sores, grievous sores, ulcers. Right? Mm -hmm. For those who believe that, you know, they're pretty, they're beautiful. They, they have good skin color, the skin smooth, all those kind of different things. And so that is of greater value than justification by faith. That skin will, will, will be laden with sores if you are not converted and among the saints, right? And the, and the second one talks about the blood. Blood, the sea turning into, into, into blood, right? It says it will fall the upon the sea. So it became as blood, talking about red tide, and every living soul died in the sea. This the living soul here is not human beings, it's fishes. So fishes are described as soul too, right? Fishes. So soul is not any, any sort of invisible thing that escapes the human body and separates itself from the human being. No, it is simply living creature. So mm -hmm. here we are told, every living creature died. So all those who are fighting now, and talking about sustainable development and the fishing industry and so on, it will all be destroyed because mm -hmm. you will not be able to retrieve any fish. Taiwan will not be able to fish in our waters and take our, fishes, our fish back to Taiwan. And the fishermen, the whole, entire fishing industry will be destroyed. And those persons who want to talk about um, this God above the clouds, so it's coming, so it's coming, and we have to preach this. We have to tell them. That's what we're doing now, Brother Shefflan. That so it's coming in your skin. You, Klaus Schraub, you, Bill My Gates, skin. you, Yuval, all of you, so it's coming in your skin under the first plague. You see that? And that's what the Bible says. And you will not be able to sit around your table and eat fish while trampling upon people's rights and freedoms and telling us to eat bugs. You see, you will not get fish to eat because the whole fishing industry will be destroyed. So this world is not getting better. There's no better to come. So they could talk all they want about the sustainable development and protecting the environment and so forth. We do have a problem with protecting the environment, by the way. Sustainable development goals. But we have a problem with their goals because they are seeking to 
to destroy humanity. They're uh-huh. selfish. They're super selfish. They're seeking to control, to get all the wealth in their hands. Mm-hmm. But this earth will be destroyed and we are seeing some of the destruction that will take place by God himself through his seven last plagues. We are at plague number three, so we can continue, Brother Sheflon. Yes. So let's go to verse 16, verse 16, uh, not verse 16, sorry. Let's go to verse four of chapter 16. It says, and the third angel poured out his vial upon the rivers and fountains of waters and they became blood. So here we have verse f- verse four telling us that the rivers became blood. So we saw that the sea before became blood and now it's the rivers. Brother Medina says here, some of the rivers and fountains that provide drinking water and water for agricultural purposes also get the red tide blood affecting society and its food supply. So everything will be, will be uh, affected. Nobody, nothing will escape. And this is why we say to you, your only security beginning right now onto that time, your only security is having the character of Christ. Because the question is, where would God's people be when all this is happening? They will be in a place of safety. He will protect them. He will provide for them. Mm -hmm. They will get food. Their water will be sure. Even as Elijah's um, food and water were sure. So you have safety only in the character of Jesus Christ that you have to accept right now before this time comes. Mm-hmm. So that was plague. That was plague number four, Brother Shaflon. That's one, plague two, number three. three. Right. So we go into the next one. So no fresh water to drink. Mm-hmm. No fresh. Some people prefer fresh water fish. No fresh water fish. Okay. So terrible heat waves from the sun kills cattle, fruit trees, agricultural products, burn down forests, dry up water, and kill many with heat stroke. Let's see this. Revelation chapter 16, 8 and 9. It says, And the fourth angel poured out his vial upon the sun, and power was given unto him to scorch men with fire. And men was scorched with great heat and blasphemed the name of God, which hath power over these plagues. And they repented not to give him glory. Mm-hmm. So they talk about climate, climate change and earth heating up. This is a real heat you will receive if you don't repent and seek God's help right now. But also, Sister Anne-Marie, they are using the sun, solar energy, as an alternative to um, what we are accustomed to. And at the same time, they are seeking to impoverish people who are using fuel. Mm -hmm. So the very sun that you talk about, oh, this is alternative energy, will turn into a plague. Scorching. And it will scorch you. And our culture will be destroyed. So first of all, you don't have water to water your plants. And then here you have great heat wave coming to kill the plants. You don't have water to give your cattle and your animals. Mm-hmm. And here is a great heat wave to kill the animals. Right? You have forest fires. You have all these things happening. People dying from heat stroke. And you, Bill Gates, would not be able to do anything about it. You would not be able to try to stop the rays of the sun from reaching the earth and all those nonsense you're talking about. Yeah. You would not be able to do anything about it. Your skin will be scorched. Yes. And Mark Zuckerberg, who is a globalist responsible for censoring free speech, censoring the truth from being spoken, he will not escape from the heat in his bunker that he's building. Right? We're on Facebook. But he needs to know that, right? Amen. So that's verse 8 and 9. We are going on now to see a dense darkness strike these nations as others in the world experience the same thing, damaging the psyche of millions in these nations. So let's go to the next plague. Revelation 16. We're still in Revelation 16, but we're looking at verse 10 this time. And we are looking now 
at plague number five, the fifth plague. What does it say? Verse 12, And the sixth angel poured out his vial upon the great river Euphrates, and the water thereof was dried up. And the way of the kings of the east, sorry, that the way of the kings of the east might be prepared. Right. So that's the dense darkness, Brother Shefflon. Yes. Amen. So Amen. it's 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 clearly No, I didn't read the right one. I'm sorry. Verse 10. I'm sorry, I read the wrong one. So this is verse this is actually verse ten I'm supposed to read now, which is the fifth. Yeah. Okay, so we looked at one, two, three, four. This is the fifth. Sorry about that, my dear listeners. Let's go to verse ten. And the fifth angel poured out his vial upon the seat of the beast, and his kingdom was full of darkness, and they gnawed their tongues for pain. So just to reread that point, a dense darkness strikes these nations as others in the world experience the same thing, damaging the psyche of millions in these nations. That was plague number five. Comment or six one? Um, you can stand. go ahead and, and read six. I remember we, we had done this, just to say this, <laughs> for devotion, and we were looking at the, the idea of darkness, right? A dense darkness. So much, so much that it, it is so dark that it, it affects your mind. And this is not a darkness where you can turn on a light and see the light. Light, the, you know, the, the light cannot penetrate that darkness. It is so dark. Right? So it, it, that must have, a, have an effect on the psyche. You know, a simple thing as current going, electricity going in a, in a community has an effect on you. Mm -hmm. Though not great, but it has an effect on you. Much more when there is this thick blackness that you can't see your hand. No sort of light will cause that to go. That is serious, serious problem for the human psyche. Mm -hmm. And I could appreciate that point very well. That, that the dense darkness, darkness strikes these nations as others in the world experience the same thing, damaging the psyche of millions in these nations. Right? So let's go now to the sixth plague. Let me read it and then read what Brother Midian says. Verse 12. So we're looking at verse 12. Still in Revelation chapter 16, we're looking at the seven last plagues. The wrath of God, the wrath of the Lamb. Verse 12 says, And the sixth angel poured out his vial upon the great river Euphrates, and the water thereof was dried up, that the way of the kings of the east might be prepared. And here's what Brother Medina says for this one. The religious trust and following of millions upon the Roman Catholic Church are severed from much of the people in these nations. So it means, therefore, that the Babylon loses support. Mm -hmm. And we, re we remember what happened in ancient Babylon. Okay? When the rivers were turned. Mm -hmm. By who took over after it was Media Persia? Media Persia. Media, Media Persia and so forth. So the, 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 um, the symbol here is that Babylon... Paul's religion will lose its support. That is what will happen. And the people will turn upon false religion. Correct. Yeah, just continue. Okay. Now let's go on to the seventh one. Then we could make some, some more commentary, right? Yeah. It says, Then an earthquake, this is Brother Medina, then... A great earthquake destroys these nations, sink their mountains, while hail, more than 50 pounds in weight, destroy po popular cities and kill millions. And we can see this in 18. So we can go from verse 18 to 21. Okay? 
from verse 18 to 21, we're going to see the seventh plague. And maybe I could read from verse 17 just to show that it's the seventh, right? So we are going to verse 17 to 21. It says, And the seventh angel poured out his vial into the air, and there came a great voice out of the temple of heaven from the throne, saying, It is done. Verse 18. And there were voices and thunders and lightnings, and there was a great earthquake, such as was not since men were upon the earth, so mighty an earthquake and so great. Verse, 20, verse 19. And the great city was divided into three parts, and the cities of the nations fell. And great Babylon came in remembrance before God to give unto her the cup of the wine of the fierceness of his wrath. So Babylon is receiving special attention here. Mm -hmm. Verse 20. And every island fled away and the mountains were not found. So the, the mountains, the mountains, all the mountains sink. Okay. The great earthquake destroys the nations. Verse 20. Let me read verse 19 again. Didn't finish it. It says, And the great city was divided into three parts, and the cities of the nations fell, and great Babylon came in remembrance before God to give unto her the cup of the wine of the fierceness of his wrath. I'm reading this, Brother Shephan, and all I'm thinking is destruction upon destruction upon destruction coming, you know. Mm -hmm. The wicked will not escape. Tall, so you could live. You figure you could live anywhere, any anyhow you want to live now, as if as if you don't have to face judgment, as if you don't have to face God bringing retribution upon you. We are saying to you, this doesn't have to be your lot. You do not have to be destroyed with the wicked. You could reject the doctrines of Babylon right now, the false doctrines including the sinful traditions like Christmas and Easter celebrations. You could reject that right now and you could accept the beautiful, lovely character of Christ to save you away from your sins so that you will not be a part of this destruction because the destruction will be great. As yeah. we are seeing, let us read verse 20 and 21. Verse 20 says, And every, every island fled away and the mountains were not were not found. Verse 21. And there fell upon men a great hail out of heaven, every stone about the weight of a talent, and men blasphemed God because of the plagues of the hail, for the plague thereof was exceeding great. So you're talking about plagues falling, Brother Sheflon, and mm -hmm. people are so well, I mean, at this point, there's no conversion. They can't be converted, converted at this point. But they are blaspheming God. They are blaspheming God. They but the point is, destruction, minds. yes, destruction is coming. Destroyed minds, yes. And you could see, you could see these, these minds are evident right now before us. Godless rabble. How they think about Christ, the conscious humans. How they present Christ, the wonderful, beautiful character of Christ to save them. And they present that, you know, in a blasphemous way. They, they speak all kind of insult against Jesus Christ. So it's not hard to see them doing that then. Because they would, they would be even more destroyed at that point in their, in their, in their mind. All right. right? So but destruction is coming. Destruction is coming. And that's the point. And it is, it is the wrath of God. And the wrath of God is his seven last plagues for the and, wicked. And that is, that is the lamb. That is coming from the lamb. The lamb overcomes them, right? Amen. And that, that's, that's the point that the, the seven last plagues will lay ruined to these and other nations. Um, let's, let's just go through a summary again of these plagues. All right. So here we have the first plague. Thank you, Sister Karima, for sending these uh, charts. Amen. First plague, evil ulcer, health and medical attack. 
um, so the entire health and medical uh, well-being of the wicked will be affected and attacked here, right? So it's an attack um, against health security. It attacks vain esteem of oneself. Uh, it shows leaders, religious, political, economic, military, that none is safe. Okay? So we, we see that from the first plague. The second and third plague, they attack climate change policies. They attack seafood supplies. All right? They attack drinking water resources. And they also attack murderous tendencies. You see? So the water was turned into blood. All right? Or the red tide. So we saw that in the... Let me maximize this. In the second and third plague. The fourth plague showed the scorching sun, which attacks global ecosystem, attacks climate change policies again, attacks people's property, it attacks people's health and safety. Okay, so we saw all of that in the fourth plague with the scorching sun. The fifth plague, dense darkness, it attacks the vindictive self-confidence of the supporters of the beast and it symbolizes near doom for the beast and his kingdom so we know all of this is is dealt with there under the fifth plague the dense darkness because that that's all that will come to their mind destruction is coming all right we didn't get the sixth plague in chart but i'll show it in the summary chart coming up the seventh plague, global earthquake, destructive lightning, cities falling, islands and mountains sink into the sea. There's destroying hail, and you find a lot of this description in Sister White's quotations as well. And the, and the world is totally destroyed by the time you get to the seventh plague. Okay? Now, these plagues will be falling. Um, not universally. I remember reading where Sister White says they will not be falling at the same time globally because it means the entire world will be wiped out by the first, second plague. Right? So um, that's something to note. Now, let me get you um, alright. Let me just move back here. Yes, I, I'm trying to retrieve that one. Okay. All right, so just bear with me a second. Let me get my summary chart. So we, right, it's here in black and white. Okay, so these are the seven plagues. This is the lamb overcoming them with his seven last plagues. All right? So remember, in the sixth plague, after the dense darkness, the religious Babylon loses support. And it loses support. And it is at this time you have the reign of who? The scarlet colored beast for 15 literal days. It's during this time that Babylon will be destroyed. All right? It's during this time that Babylon will be destroyed. So this indeed is the seven last plagues, the lamb overcoming. Mm -hmm. All right? Okay. All right, so let's continue. Now we've seen all of that. And the Bible tells us that this is called the Battle of Armageddon. So the Lamb overcomes these ten nations through the Battle of Armageddon, which is the year of the plagues. And this is what this chart is also highlighting, that these plagues are also called the Battle of Armageddon. So this is, this is Jesus Christ, the Lamb, fighting or overcoming. 
the battle of the great day of Yahweh God Almighty, it is called. And it is also called the wrath of God. So we can look at some scriptures pointing that out. In Revelation chapter 16, from verse 13 to 16. Revelation 16, from verse 13 to 16. Yes. Okay, so it says, And I saw three unclean spirits like frogs come out of the mouth of the dragon and out of the mouth of the beast and out of the mouth of the false prophet. For they are the spirits of devils or demons working miracles, which go forth unto the kings of the earth and of the whole world to gather them to the battle of that great day of God Almighty. So they are, they are, they are actually uniting to fight against God. Eh? Mm -hmm. how, how deceived the mind can be to think that they could fight against the Creator. Verse, six, verse 15. Behold, I come as a thief. Blessed is he that watcheth and keepeth his garment, lest he walk naked and they see his shame. Right. Down to 16. Down to 16. 16. Yes. And he gathered them together in a place called in the Hebrew, in the Hebrew tongue, Armageddon. Right. So here we have the Bible speaking about the battle of Armageddon. So while they unite to fight against God, mm -hmm. he will overcome them with the seven last plague. Yes. With his wrath, with destruction. This Precisely. battle called the battle of Armageddon. And you see who the Bible identifies. The three unclean spirits like frog coming out of the mouth of the dragon, the beast. The, sorry, the dragon, the beast, and the false prophets. Mm -hmm. Right? It's false religion again. And, they are all, and it says, verse 14, For they are the kings of demons, mm -hmm. the spirits of spirits demons, of sorry, working miracles which go forth unto the kings of the earth and of the whole world to gather them to battle. So, Everybody, all the wicked, will be gathered to battle against Yahweh. And this is a case where they are being gathered for the plagues. That's what they are being gathered for. The concepts, the values of Babylon and the king of the south, atheism, communism, globalism, and their multitudinous immoralities. These in the mind blasphemy. are gathering the people together to receive the plagues. All that's, right, that's God fighting back. Because God is not going to fight man on man with with um with with the king of the north and the king of the south. It's destruction he's bringing. Mm -hmm. Now let's look at Isaiah thirty four. All right, Isaiah thirty four, and we read in verses from verse one. To verse 5. Let me, let me read that quickly. Isaiah 34 from verse 1 to 5. And here's what it says. Come near ye nations to hear. And hearken ye people. Okay. Let the earth hear. And all that is therein. The world and all things. That come forth of it. For the indignation of Yahweh is upon all nations. Notice. All nations. And his fury upon all their armies. He had utterly destroyed them. He had delivered them to the slaughter. Their slain also shall be cast out. And their stink shall come up out of their carcasses. And the mountain shall be melted with their blood. Can you imagine that? All you see on the mountain ranges is blood. Blood just pouring down the mountains. It goes on. And all the host of heaven shall be dissolved. And the heaven shall be rolled together as a scroll. And all their hosts shall fall down as the leaf falleth out of the vine. And as the falling fig from the fig tree. For my sword shall be bathed. In heaven, behold, it shall come down upon Idume and upon the people of my curse to judgment. The apostles religion receiving the wrath of God. 
to the extent where their blood will be flooding the earth. Can you imagine Slaying that? Look at the Smart. look at the look at the description being used here to 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 show what God will bring during the um during the seven last plagues. Did you do see that? And it says in verse five, for my sword, yeah. the destruction is from God Himself. It is yes. God who is fighting. Yes. All right. So you don't stand a chance to say you and fight against God. Now. What, are, what else are we told? Verse 8. Verse 8 says, Okay, so we're in Isaiah chapter 34. Verse 8, it says, For it is the day of Yahweh's vengeance and a year of recompense for the controversy of Zion. Did you see that? So it is the day, it's called the day of Yahweh's vengeance, the year of recompense. So we're talking about the year of the plagues, because that is the year of recompense. Mm -hmm. It is the day of Yahweh's vengeance or the year of his recompense for the controversy of Zion. So you want to persecute the saints? Mm -hmm. You want to persecute, you want to kill Christ through his saints? Punishment coming for you, you know? Retribution coming for you? Those who, play, who think that they're big and bad because they have some arms and weaponry. You know, and they could persecute God's people, the young man and the young woman out there who figure they, you know, they're big and they're bad, you know, and they have gun and they have knife and, you know, nobody could do them anything. Nobody could tell them anything. You, you carry the gospel to them and they figure, you know, who are you? You know, gospel is, 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 is nothing to them. They treat, they treat it as if it's dirt. You will have to bow. You will be destroyed. Yes. So what do we say to you? Repent of your sins now. Give up your idolatry. Give up your idol values. Give up your rebellion. And receive the character of Jesus Christ. That you will not be a part of this destruction. Amen. But you will be a part of God's church. That's Amen. what we are saying to you. Amen. Do you remember? And you know, now that you said that, bear in mind that God is calling, right? So his saints are the called at this point, right? And at this point, we are receiving persecution. Didn't we will lose our jobs as a result of the king of the south's policies? Yes. Working through the mine of a Judas goat here in St. Vincent, who decided he's going to mandate an experimental substance which has, be, which has resulted in the death and injury of millions across the globe, including here in St. Vincent Tandigan. That is, that, is, that is them warring against the lamb. Because it's, it's the principles we hold that cause us to make the decision. Yeah. Yes. That God is the one who... God alone must mandate our consciences. He alone has rule over our consciences. And we have a duty to obey the convictions that he places upon our heart. We have a duty to obey his word. So when his word says that our bodies are his temple for him to dwell in, and when his word says we shall do no murder, which will include suicide, we have to follow what his word says. Exactly. Even when we are persecuted, exactly. we still have to follow what his word says. But we know that destruction is coming for those who persecute the saints of God. Exactly. And so we call you to repent. Even now, while there is, while there, there is time, repent of your sins and let God change you. Let God justify you so that you will not be a part of this. Exactly. But when we tell some of them to repent, they ask, who are you to tell me to repent? Mm -hmm. That's Remember what our Judas that? good prime minister said, yes. That's what our Judas good prime minister said when I told him in a letter to repent because he has become a curse to the people of St. Vincent and the Grenadines through his policies. He asked, repent, who are you to tell me to repent? 
So if he does not repent, here's what Job says in Job chapter 38. First, Evan, just before you go on, that is why when you hear the warnings, when we give you the warnings from the scriptures, heed them. Don't be proud and rebellious in your mind and talk like, who are you? And, you know, you, you, you're looking at where we come from, for example, or how we look or what we have and we don't have. Instead of considering the message that we are bringing to you, the message of warning and at the same time, the message of hope because it is your salvation. We are concerned about, despite the, the persecution you bring upon us, despite the evil you do to us and you say about us, we are saying to you to repent of your sins, to give it up, that you don't have to continue like that. You don't have to be like that. There's a way. There's a way for you to follow. There's a way for you to be rid of the evils in your mind that cause you to do the evils that you do to us and to the people in general. And instead of accepting what we are saying for your own salvation, you continue in your arrogance. And we are still saying to you, stop it. Because if you continue, you'll be destroyed without remedy. But we have to tell you what the scripture says. Yes. It is for your salvation's sake. And we'll continue until the work on out is our work on out is done, right? Amen. That's here's our mission. What, here's what uh, Job 38 says and verse, verse 22, 22 and 23. We are told. Has thou entered into the treasure of the treasures of the snow? Or hast thou seen the treasures of the hail? Remember, hail is one of the plagues. Yes. So here, Don't even in the time of Job, he is speaking about the plagues. Then verse 23 says, Which I have reserved against the time of trouble, against the day of battle and war. So we are told here of a day of battle and war. This is the same. Armageddon. This is the same battle of Armageddon. Mm -hmm. This is the same day or year of Yahweh's vengeance. This is what we are told here. It is the it is the wrath of God. Now let's let's look at um. So so Job showed that by pointing out one of the examples of the plagues, mm -hmm. which is hail, which which Revelation says will be more than more than fifty pounds in weight, destroying cities and killing millions. Right. So let's look at Isaiah now. Isaiah chapter 13. In Isaiah chapter 13, we are told this. We are going to read from verse 4. A few verses in Isaiah 13. Okay? So here's what it says. It says, The noise of a multitude, verse 4, The noise of a multitude in the mountains, like as of a great people, a tumultuous noise of the kingdoms of, the, of nations gathered together. Yahweh of hosts mustered the hosts of the battle. They come from a far country, from the end of heaven, even Yahweh, and the weapons of his indignation to destroy the whole land. How ye for the day of Yahweh is wrath is, is, is at hand, sorry. It shall come as a destruction from the Almighty. Therefore shall all hands be faint, and every man's heart shall melt. And they shall be afraid. Pangs and sorrows shall take hold of them. They shall be in pain as a woman that travail it. Alright? So only women can travail. Right? Only women can, can give birth. Can bear a child. Important. They shall be amazed one at another. Their faces shall be as flames. You're looking at people with you understand? Behold, the day of Yahweh cometh, cruel, both in wrath, with wrath, both with wrath and fierce anger, to lay the land desolate, and he shall destroy the sinners of out of it. Thereof, out of it. Okay. And then it goes on to. So we to, see clearly who the destruction is for. Yes. Goes on to say in verse 10 For the stars of heaven and the constellations thereof shall not give their light. The sun shall be darkened in his going forth, and the moon shall not cause her light to shine. So, and, and I will punish the world for their evil and the wicked for their iniquity, and I will cause the arrogancy of the proud to cease, and will lay low the haughtiness of the terrible. 
This is what the Bible is saying. This is what God is saying. This is what God is saying. Yahweh is saying he will lay you low. He is saying he will cause the arrogancy of your pride to cease. I will make a man more precious than fine gold, even a man than a golden wedge of ophir. So men will become scarce upon the earth mm -hmm. because of the destruction that Yahweh will bring during the time of the plagues. We are told in verse, th verse 13, Therefore I will shake the heavens and the earth shall remove out of her place and the wrath of Yahweh of hosts in the wrath of Yahweh of hosts and in the day of his fierce anger. So it is also described as the day of his fierce anger, which is the year of recompense. So there we have it. The lamb overcomes. How does the lamb overcome these nations? How does the lamb overcome them? Through the battle of Armageddon, which is the year of the plague. And the Bible has multiple references in the Old Testament that describing how it will be. And we are given this for our own warning. We are given this for us to see that the values we hold, the idols we hold on to is nothing. Pride is selfishness, lack of Pride humility. Pride is nothing. Heartiness is nothing. Because that cannot stand in the day of Yahweh's vengeance. That cannot stand in the battle of Armageddon. Because here the scripture says, God himself says, he will punish the hearty. And he will lay low the proud. That's what we are told here. And it doesn't matter who you are, whether it be Prime Minister, King, like the wicked King of England, who wants to see the population and the, and the globalist movement spread and, and all, all sorts of lunacy. It doesn't matter who you are, God will lay you low. Your only safety is in having the Lamb. Your only safety is in justification by faith. Amen. So I know we're coming down to close to 8 o'clock, Sister Anne-Marie. So let us, um, let's look at, we'll have to continue next week, God's willing. All right, because we have much more to discuss. We need to look at the Lamb being the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. We need to call the chosen and the faithful. Mm -hmm. We need to look at all of that. Right? Because all of that is in this very important vo vo verse in Revelation chapter 17. So what we'll do at this point Yes. All right. So this, this, is a, this is a chat that we want to reflect a little bit on from uh, Sabbath Bible study. Let me just share it here. As you remember, we were looking at just now we saw in Isaiah that the wicked will be destroyed. Mm -hmm. That's what we saw. It is the wicked that would receive the seven last plagues. So it means you have to give up that wickedness now. You have to overcome sin now. We have to overcome sin now. We have to give up all idols now. And there's help. There's help in God's church. Who has the gospel. The gospel of Jesus Christ. Which has the pillars that has been built by wisdom. To help you. And this is some of the help we want to talk about in this chat, Brother Sheflon. You might have to. All right, let me just maximize it. Okay, right. better. Amen. So it is called help in overcoming for the end. What does it say? Let me just let me just give a little context. I think this is also important. You see, okay. Enthusiast Seventh day Adventist Church, we are the church for the end. This is a revival of true Seventh-day Adventism and ancient apostolic Christianity. You want apostolic Christianity, you find it here in Tuesday, Seventh-day Adventism. Yeah, we, make, we are not boasting, we are just speaking the truth. 
you want true Seventh-day Adventism, you will not find it in general conference-led churches. They are busy having their young people dancing and whining to music that emphasize sexual immorality. Is they are too busy celebrating Christmas. celebrating Christmas. They are busy getting themselves involved in transsexualism. They are busy getting themselves involved in ecumenism. And their president dressing in, in women clothing and so on, calling it culture. But you find in this church, the, the revival, we are the revival of true Seventh-day Adventists. And since we are the revival that God has raised up, God has given us the plan. We have the plan. And this plan, when effected in the hearts of our members, causes sin to be alleviated from each of us so that we can fulfill, so that we can fulfill the purpose that God has designed for us to fulfill. And so, because we have this plan, and if you are in a church, if you are in a congregation that cannot teach you how to overcome your sins, how to prepare for the what is to come, how to prepare to pass safe in the judgment, how to prepare to face the crises ahead, then you need to leave that and join us. Amen. Because they have no plan, and God has already determined God has already determined who his people are in the last days. It is this remnant Amen. that has the faith of Jesus Christ and the commandments of God so that there is no plan of salvation in Babylon and her daughters, in the Roman Catholic papacy and the fallen Protestants and evangelicals. They have no plan for your salvation. The scripture says that they are fallen from grace. So there's no salvation to be had there. And that's Amen. why we exist, to call you out from those Babylonian religions, to join the truth and to experience the plan that causes you to have the revealed truths of Jesus Christ into your heart, becoming your subjective experience, shown forth in obedience to the commandments of God, in a sin-free experience and with preparation to pass in the investigative judgment under judicial grace. And so it's important for you to understand what is going to be shown here in this chart in a summary format because this is part and parcel of the preparation Amen. which is derived from the plan that God has invested in his church. We are the church of the living God. Amen. Amen, Amen brother Shem. And it's important for you to understand that. So let's look at the chart then. Amen. So it says, so help in overcoming for the end. What are some of the help we are offering you out of our church by God's grace? First one, pray for increased faith that concerns spiritual honesty and sincerity. And we were told that it is the faith, the faith in us, that causes honesty and sincerity. And since that is the case, we must pray and ask God to give us faith. And we know that the faith is the revealed truths of God. So we must pray and ask God to give us revealed truths to build our honesty, to build our sincerity. The second point, all cherished sinful desires as a habit must be destroyed by unraveling faith. Again, we see the importance of faith. You must have the faith. So you want cherish sinful desires as a habit to be destroyed. If we want that to be our experience, then it is the faith that must be used to, un to unravel them. It is the faith that must be used to see them for what they really are and give us what it takes to reject them. Because it is faith in our heart that motivates us to do righteousness, to reject sin, and to do righteousness. Okay? So it is the unraveling faith we need to be rid of all cherished sinful desires that we have as a habit. Next help we have here. Think with prayer 
the faith again you see the faith is being featured think with prayer the faith that causes endurance for hunger weariness and delay so we must be prayerful but we must be thinking we must be thinking faith while we are prayerful and what is this faith for what is this this faith to help us in it is to help us to endure but to endure what to endure hunger to endure weariness or tiredness and delay because these are all trials that we will face these are all trials that we face right now and that we will continue to face but what must we have to be able to face these trials victoriously without falling into sin we need the faith we need to pray we need, we need to ask god to strengthen us to strengthen us with the faith that we may glorify him as god alone so these are some of the help these are some of the things we offer as help to you because we want you to be saved and these are the things that are offered to us members in this Tuesday Seventh day adventist church so we give them to you we invite you to partake of them because we ourselves have to experience them by the grace of god as his church so we call you onto this experience we call you in a place where you can get help you can get help to overcome all of your sins you can get help to prepare you for heaven and the new earth society you can get help to prepare you from for what is to come the global civil war we can you can get help to to prepare you that you will not receive the seven last plagues the wrath of god the wrath of the lamb mm -hmm. and that help is found in the character of jesus christ and we just give you some practical ways of overcoming sin for the end amen we want to thank you for joining us tonight amen and we pray that you'll join us again next week when we'll continue our discussion on revelation chapter 17 verse 14 and uh, at this point, we want to end with our closing. So let us pray. Dear gracious Father in heaven, we thank you for the truths that you have revealed to our minds concerning what will happen to those who fight against you. You are going to fight back against them, O oh dear Father, through the seven last plagues. You have shown us these things clearly from the scriptures to warn us that we will not find ourselves on the wrong side of the controversy fighting against you. But we will find ourselves with you, the Lamb, having your character, having the experience of justification by faith that we may be saved from sin and from the destruction that attends. We ask you for your continued help. We thank you, dear God, for giving, giving us these truths in our church, that we can experience them by your grace. We are so thankful and that we can have the opportunity to share them with others. We pray that all who have heard and all who will hear, they will accept these truths before it is too late. They will find peace and comfort and purpose in you, O oh dear Father. They will find themselves having the character of Christ to face the end because it is only with the character of Christ we can face the end victoriously. Help us, we pray, and help them. Grant us the continual working of your Holy Spirit upon our hearts. Work upon minds in different countries, O oh dear Father. Give us beachheads. Give us miracles, O oh dear Father, to do the final works before you, you put in your end, O oh dear loving Father. Help us, we pray. Have mercy upon us. Give us absolute humility and depend, dependence upon you, O dear Father, for you are our help and we can do nothing without you. These things we pray and we thank you very much for hearing us and for helping us. In Jesus' wonderful name with thanksgiving. Amen and amen. 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 So once again, thank you so much for joining us, my dear brethren and friends. And do join us again next week, God's willing. Grace and peace to every single one of you. We are seeing you 
Sister Lisa, Sister Tuzian Matthews, uh, Brother Marlon Martin, Sister Chantel, uh, Sister Karima, all of you. Grace and peace. Thank you so much for participating tonight, Sister Ariel. Thank you so much for sharing and for sharing your comments. Thank you for sharing the program. And we hope to see you again next week, God's willing, when we'll continue our discussion by God's grace. So until we meet again, Grace and in peace. In Jesus' holy name. Bye-bye. <laughs>